Hey, welcome back. Such a nice uh, opportunity, uh, for me at least, to be able to share ideas that I spent a lifetime trying to sort out. You're about, I, a lot of you are, are probably at the beginning phase of that uh, marvelous thing. And I sometimes tell my students, it's like you've been up to Mount Everest. Uh, maybe that would be pretentious, but you've been to some advanced uh, place and you're, and you're, you're this, um, as it were, sort of a tour guide from time to time. And we're all in the same kind of a struggle. Anybody who's trying to, to be a painter is in the same kind of a struggle. But I get a, I get a lot of amusement out of sharing notes, uh, comparing notes with uh, people who are, I find in, shall we say, the foothills of the big problem. Uh, there's another side to it that I think is actually interesting, and that is that at some point as you're going along, it can be very daunting to the point where you'll try to find uh, uh, a place, a, a happy place to live, like in the foothills, instead of actually in, the, in these exotic peaks where you can hardly breathe where the oxygen is so thin that you may not be able to, uh, to keep putting one foot ahead of the other. And, uh, but I like, to, I like to think of that as kind of a fun prospect for you, you know, think of yourself as in the ideal, you know, you're climbing a, a, a mountain that, rare, that, that very few people have actually successfully climbed. And, um, and I'm talking about just to be really, really good at your trade. Uh, and it's true of everybody's businesses, different ones. I mean, you don't have a great many great sports figures. You have a lot of really good ones, and then you have a few people that just, and wonder what that is, right? But um, so to the extent that, you know, what you should really do is look at the work of anybody, including myself. You should look at my work and others, but look at the work of the person you're talking to and see whether it's worthy or, and be, while you're looking at it, you have a much better idea of what he's saying for that matter. So that's an awful lot of conversation just to get us started on a point. Uh, the point, uh, the question of the day uh, is from uh, David. This is also from David B. He sent me three at the same time, so I'm trying to get them all uh, in, the, for, in the several weeks together. Uh, so his question is, can you talk about the relations between form, flatness, and texture? Yeah, that's actually interesting in the sense that uh, uh, to the guy with a an impressionist mind, you know, and 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 that was a student of mine. Um, I I sometimes talk about this sort of thing in a conversation about values, and uh, I don't know how much I lay it out in sort of a you know in a theoretical sense, but um, I always, when a student is studying with me and drawing um, uh, a cast which we do you know, pretty, pretty routinely, like, like most people in this field. It's just a nice, you can set, make it a black and white study, no color, and uh, you can set forth so many of the basic ideas involved in making pictures for a student to think about. It's a, like a naming proce process, but when we get to the point of doing values, which all these things consist in, right? The idea of flatness, the idea of f form, form is the sense of roundness, right? And we don't mean anything else than that in this conversation. I know that in the world of art, the word form takes all kinds of other things. Also in a different world, in the world of, um, I mean, music is one form and dance is another, and this is, painting is another form, you know? So um, we mean here though, when we're talking about form, we do mean the, um, the creation of the sense of the round on a, on a flat panel, of, on, a, on a canvas or whatever we're working with. So it matters that we know we're talking about values, but I tell students early on with the cast, when I lay out the idea of making areas like making the shadows flat, a very fundamental thing to the, to the early training of Boston School kind of training, that shadows are flat. And uh, if shadows are flat, and by the way, for those people who didn't study with Gamel, anybody who studied with even the indirect study uh, from Gamel, you would have heard that shadows are flat, as flat as a hat, why they're flatter than that. Uh, as, the, as this way of making it sort of memorable, the idea that shadows are flat. But then, you have, of course, it's very helpful to have someone like Gamble standing in the room next to you, helping you flatten your shadows. <laughs> but, um, but I like to say to students that the first form, really the first thing you have to be able to do well is to make an area free of modulations. You have to be able to produce a flat shadow in the case of a cast. And flat just means there's no darks, no lights. No darks, no lights, no, nothing. You know, it's just blank. 
And um, that seems silly in some ways, but actually to do it well, is, it's really daunting the first time you, <laughs> you set yourself out to do it. Um, most people are constantly looking, in the case of sh shadows, for all of what's happening next and next, and reflections and this and all that sort of stuff, and trying to get form in the shadows and all sorts of things. Well, if you have multiple light sources, there'll be form all over the place. And part of the reason you wind up in a chaotic world when you're doing too many light sources is because there's form everywhere. There's no place to rest the eye. And I'm not trying to get into that, except that flatness is areas without form are, at least in terms of form, are eye-resting areas. They're areas of quiet, of repose, you could say, a place where your eyes don't have to do anything and study anything and there's nothing. <laughs> um, so, but on the other hand, there's the areas that are busy, right? And the simplest of the busy areas are a form. For example, if you're doing a vase, the form, or just say you're doing a ball, the form is just simply a ball, right? The, uh, or the sense of the roundness of, of something that's, you know, circumscribed by, by a circle. There's a sense of roundness there. And so, all your, so what we're doing there is we're creating a sense of um, a modulation, right? The modulation from light to middle tone to dark. Uh, if you know your if you know your stuff, if you study the way we teach, you would understand that the shadow line, thanks to Da Vinci, you'd understand there is such a thing. You understand the, the you understand the shadow line is the beginning of the atmospheric flatness that is the shadows, right? And um, you'd understand that the form begins after that. This is very explicit in Gamble's conversation with a student. He would say, "Shadows are flat, but the lights are not." The lights, the, the, the variations, the, the modulations within the lights is constant. So the values are always moving in the lights and they're always saying form names. And so, so you know, the simplest one is like an egg or a ball, you know, and the underlying form of the head, you know, it may have forms and things on it, but the underlying form of the head isn't, could be said to be an egg. And there are many situations in, in lightings and that sort of thing in which you can see it from, from a distance. I remember when I was a student, I was... I was looking at, at uh, Perugino, and of course the early, the source of Raphael's early knowledge, and uh, it looked like he had, paint, had drawn these imaginative heads with eggs as heads, you know, and then put features on these eggs. And I thought, you know, that's a formulaic thing and blah, 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 you know, and students will tend to uh, look down on it just a bit because they have a whole other body of information that follows Perugino, including Raphael himself. And, uh, but I remember, the big surprise was I was a young student walking down Newberry Street, and of course, you're always aware of the girls on the street if you're a guy. And uh, so I saw three young women walking toward me, you know, sort of my age kind of women, and there they were walking toward me, and they were such a distance from me, like a block away. And I simply saw three figures with three eggs for heads. I didn't see the features, but I plainly saw the Parachino egg. Uh, but so anyway, that's just for the fun. So, but that's that's the uh, making sure I get this question right um, between form, flatness, and texture. So, so you would say that form, in that sense, that roundness is also form. The egg is also form. Flatness is form, right? In a sense. But if you eliminate all flatness, your picture won't have form in that in that sense. It won't have roundness if you just make everything a cutout, like a poster so often is. Uh, certain kinds of posters so often are. And it's very useful. And, um, but then uh, the question of texture. Uh, and so one of the things that happens in painting as an Impressionist, and I remember seeing this for the first time in Paxson when I saw that he'd painted a beautiful stomach or whatever, some passage of a painting uh, on a woman, that, a nude, that Gamble had painted. And I said, what a beautiful stomach. What a beautiful job. And he said, well, Paxton did that. But I remember what I observed was this beautiful flow of soft forms. You know, the, the, fluid, the fluid forms. And then as I stood closer, I saw red and yellow and blue and all these colors, all these colors shifting in various ways throughout this beautiful form. Well, that was an interesting moment for me because it was at that moment that I realized something that I'd been doing as a student. The first guy I studied with was an Impressionist. And we would, use, we would use broken color, right? A Monet kind of a thing. And we didn't have the brains to, to get the values right. 
of the area when it was flat. So we would frequently get a person looking pockmarked. We'd get the color changes, but we'd have the values not under control, right? And so if you're painting a wall and there's a color movement through it, so the wall is flat, but there's a color movement, the colors are constantly changing, well, then you have to make sure your values where the wall shows as flat are staying constant, that there's no dark light, dark light, dark light. And what you'll notice is that dark light, dark light, dark light gives the wall a texture. It gives it a broken, the broken values are what we think of as texture. Your hand, if you ran your hand over a textural thing, you'll feel the roughness of it. So on a wall, you'd feel the lumpity, lumpity, lumpiness of it. So texture is just broken values, right? Now, in a generic sense, that's true. And, you know, if you're trying to say, you know, in a picture and how you use it, texture, textured areas are busier. So you don't get to rest in those textured areas. And so you have to know if you're, com if you're a composer, you have to know whether you want me <laughs> to be not able to rest. You want me, my eyes to be staying a little hectic here. And in fact, when you do texture, and Degas is a nice example of it, when you do texture, and if you're an abstract player, you know, if you know how to play with compositionally, you'll play the set of the textures. You know, this texture area, you're talking to the other texture. The, the set, the, the textures are in conversation with each other as a set. So much like the, you know, the spades or the hearts or the clubs are sets, the textures are a set and they actually commune with each other much like, and the flat areas will do the same thing with each other. And if you're unaware of it, you're unaware of where the music, where significant portions of the music come from in our kind of painting. Uh, I've been kind of long-winded on that. I'm not sure I should keep going, but uh, you, could, you could paint, um, a jacket, say, and that's, I wish I'd brought a more textured jacket today, but you could paint the lump, 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 and noodle every little lump, lump, dark light, dark light, dark light, you know, lumping your way along through this thing. Um, the Impressionist, anybody laying in a jacket uh, might do that, the, sort of the realist would, might do that to get the sort of the tromp literalism of those things. The texture can be implied by just simply broken values. I don't think I want to say any more about that now. I, I'm hoping David will get back to me and tell me if that's adequate or if there's a more finer, you know, if there's a finer point he was trying to get me to talk about. But uh, anyway, thank you, um, David, for that question. And uh, uh, be sure to subscribe, uh, like, um, or make comments. And as I said before, uh, make, make a debating point. Uh, as long as you don't do three pages, because I'll find that difficult to read. But make a, make a point or two. Challenge me if you, if you choose to. Um, Remember, I'm coming from the Boston School. It's, it's a, Gamow re, did refer to it as the greatest evolution of Impressionism, uh, the Boston School itself. And, and I think that stands to, uh, you know, uh, the, shall we say that, that expression, that definition stands the test of uh, long observation. Um, so uh, everything I'm saying is coming from that point of view. You know, we're looking at what things do in relation to each other. And we're very much invested in truth um, in, in as explicitly as needed and, uh, and not explicitly and as not needed, you know. It's always from the greater and you could say from the general to the specific, but, but so much of what we do is uh, more complex than that. So let me get out of this one. Uh, I'm wandering a bit. Thank you very much. Look forward to seeing you next time.